So what I want to do is look at Cerdes, cereal, these cereal, P and N, we all know all of this stuff. I want to look at differential pair, but not at the differential pair, at the things that are going to happen if you go faster. Because where do we go faster? Diff pair. So I want to look at some of the things that you could fall into. So this is kind of a 10,000 foot level of be careful of these things. So I picked like 10 things to look at, and then we're just going to look at them and say, well, what is this and why is it important? Because a lot of people, come on, most of the world has not even touched anything faster than 10G. That's it. Well, a lot of people have been doing fours and fives and sevens and eights. And then when they get above the 10 in that kind of range, the physics start counting a bit more. You're going faster, your wavelengths are shorter, your rising full times are faster, so things are more important. PC material, stack up, crosstalk, fiber weave effect, stubs and back drilling, surface rustiness, insertion loss, return loss, effects and necks, that's your crosstalk, breakout regions or signal launches, how do you break out your part? You know, you don't hit that automatic breakout button anymore. That doesn't seem to work too well. So caps, we need to look at some of these things that were more of a secondary effect than they were a primary effect as they are now. And here's an easy example. Here's a beautiful eye at one gigabit a second. When they took the same traces, everything was the same, all they did was put a new driver in and pop it up to 10. See any difference? So just because you had some really good rules of thumb before, you know, one or two and a half PCI Express one, and goes, you know, I can do this stuff. That means you can make incredible mistakes doing slower designs, and you take those exact same mistakes, this is the same board, and look what happens. And this was because they didn't match it very well. They had skew. And at slower speeds, skew wasn't that important. Well, now it is important. So I just want to show that some of these things are important. First, there's a lot of talk, especially on the SI list, there's a lot of talk on what about stitching vias? You know, you go from one layer that is ground referenced, go to another layer that is ground referenced, do you have to have vias around those P and N transitions? Do you have to have those? Because before you didn't, you do now. Because now there's so much energy in the faster frequencies, because what happens? Everyone says, well, the P and N cancel each other out. Is that true? If you have a P and an N for your differential pair, where does the return current flow? A lot of engineers say, well, if you have a P and an N, they flow in the different directions, so the return current for the P flows on the N, and the return current for the N flows on the P. Is that true? Not at all. Where do they flow? To your reference plane. Could be ground, could be power, that's your choice. Well, if I go from one reference plane to another, same reference planes, I'm showing this in the same reference planes, ground, where does the return current go? You're moving along here, and you can see the wave goes over here, it goes down. Where's the return current? There's no path to connect those two references together, so it radiates. And that radiation is noise. I was, I was wondering, on some of them you were showing a, like a, a power end ground, the return, you know, where you're putting between the power and the ground. Like, yes. Do you, do you do a stitching via for both? At, you know, the transition point. You got it. Okay. I'm assuming that we're going to go from one reference or two to exactly the same. If you don't, remember I showed you the split plane? You notice it destroys your signals. This will do the same thing. So you have to, we call it stitching, stitching them together. You have to give a connectivity path for that return current. If not, it goes down, your vias radiate and go out. And any time that hits another via, you got crosstalk. So, yes, you need these vias. Now, in the slower designs, you didn't need them so much. But remember, I'm saying we're going to go up a little bit faster. 
Even on your PCI Express 3, it says right there, you have to have two vias. And it's easy to show. Let's put some vias in. What's it look like now? Because you return current, here's your P. With return current, here's your N with return current. They go here, they go down together and back on another layer. Notice it's not a problem now. That's a huge difference. So look at the difference between here and here. So do you need stitching vias? Yes, you do. As you can go faster and faster and you need more than two. Questions on what I'm showing? I think that's a good 3D simulation. Next thing is, where does the current flow in a via? Does it flow on the inside, the outside? What if the V is completely filled? What if it's capped? A little hard to see, but the current, return current, look, on the via, where does it flow? On the outside of the via. It does not flow on the inside of the via. That's doc, our friend, Dr. Gauss, that says, look, it's gonna flow on the outside because this is a almost perfectly enclosed structure and you're not gonna have fields on the inside. So it flows on the outside of the via where you have what? Where you have your plating. It flows out on the inside? No, a little bit, almost nothing. If I fill the via, will it make any difference? No, this is skin effect. Now, do not get this mixed up, and a lot of people do. If you fill the via and it's a power supply via, that's different, that's DC. DC, you give me all the volume you can give me. Give me, give me, give me. If it's AC, it's surface area, it's not volume anymore. That's a lensless current. So, where does the current flow? And I gave you a side view also. You've got your planes, you've got your signal. Where does it go? Down through here and over. How much current do you have inside that hole? Because before I thought, well, it's going to flow everywhere. That's not true. Questions on what I'm showing? When in doubt, simulate it. Now, some of you, you guys have done PCI 3, right? PCI Express 3, some of those? Okay. When you start going faster, 3, and you know 4 was just to release the spec on that, you've got what? You've got DC blocking capacitors, just like you do on the other ones. Now that we're going faster, those DC blocking capacitors, notice I don't have the capacitor, I just have what? The mounting pads. Well, what's a mounting pad on top of a ground plane? Well, it's a capacitor. It's going to be a capacitor that's going to be larger than the trace. I mean, come on, look at the size. So you need to make that capacitor lower so that you don't have an impedance discontinuity. Remember, Z equals square root of L over C. C goes up, imp impedance goes down, you have a discontinuity, you have a reflection. So what do we do? We're going, okay, we know this is bad. So the next layer down, I'm assuming next layer down on two is ground. You need to cut out the ground plane to remove the excess capacitance. Notice your P and N, you remove it here, don't connect it all together because you need return path spacing here. Here, so you do this and this. How big is that rectangle? I don't know, it depends on your stack up and your material, but you can simulate that. Now, be careful if you do this because uh, in their design guidelines, Intel for their PCI Express, they'll tell you what you need to do it's almost always for FR4 since they want the cheap junk. Tell you what to do. Be careful on layer three. 
Do you want to want run traces under this hole in the plane? No, because then your impedance goes up again. So be careful, but you need to do this. And for different stack ups, different materials, different size capacitors, this is for an 0402, these dimensions will change. Come on, different materials. Remember, E sub R controls impedance, which is capacitance. So you need to, you'll have different ones for each material you use. Has anyone done that yet? You go faster, you're going to start doing it. What tool do you use to simulate? Uh, any of the 3D tools now, which you can do it in this tool now. And it makes a difference. Uh, the DDR 3 and 4, you don't have to worry about these things. Questions on that slide? We typically do above PCI Express 1. So that's 1's 2.5, so 3, 5. On PCI Express 2 and 3, their design guidelines, Intel's, will show you exactly how to do this. Now, if you change material, because they usually show it for the cheaper stuff, then you will have to change those dimensions. And if you do a, a simulation before and after, you will see a big difference. Like you said, that's really kind of depending on what your stack would be, right? Oh, baby. Because if you cut that out, then your reference plane may be a power plane. Below that, then you're referencing a power plane all of a sudden. Well, for me, if I'm going to do differential pair, PCI Express, Guess where I'm going to reference it to? Ground. Just get used to the idea if it's serial, it's ground. Because that's what they do on the controller chips anyway. It's ground there. Come on, it's an easy one. Everyone's got ground. Not everyone's got 3.3 or 2.5 or, I mean, pick one. So this is the easy one. It's ground. And if you've you got to break out, the capacitors have to be on the top and the bottom. Well, if they're on the top, that means layer two is ground. What choice do you have? So these kind of things control your stack up, of course. Let's talk about stub length. You got a via, it can go down forever, you notice I didn't stop it. And you go in, I'll pick one. You go in layer one with a trace and you want to come out on layer three. You're routing them both on those layers. Signal goes in, over here and goes out. Where else does it go? Of course, down. Now, if the signal is fast enough or the board is thick enough, then that can cause a stub. I mean, that's standard RF there. You can make a stub anytime you want, accidentally or, or not. And once it gets to those kind of speeds or thicknesses, it causes problems. So look, you got a part here, part here, you want to connect them together. I love to connect them together all on layer one, but how many rows in on your BGA can you route that out? Two, maybe three. So then you've got a stub here, and then you've got a stub here, both. If you do a part here, and then you add a connector. Then you're gonna have a plated through hole stub and a via stub. Now, what many people do, there's some, there's some ways to fix this. You can fix this with blind vias. You can fix this with buried vias. All you have to do is rub money on your board. We know what those cost. Or it seems like the cheapest thing to do is back drilling. Has everyone heard of back drilling? You've got these stubs, you can see them. You drill back and remove the copper from the via so it's just a hole and it's not a conductor anymore, which means it's not a stub. So all you do is back drill both of those and guess what, your stub's gone. It's very common above 10 gig. And then typically 
fat boards. And 063, nah, don't worry about it. It's the bigger boards. But if you've got a, like a 22 layer board, you're sure not gonna do an 063. You're probably at, what, one and a quarter then? Okay, so what it is is they have connectors. Do, does everyone here know what a press fit connector is? Oh, good. You know, they have them and they press fit and these expand inside. And then what you can do is back drill to that layer. Here's your grounds, they go all the way through, all right? Here's a back drill that looks like it goes about halfway up. Here's a back drill that goes about a third up. So on your back drilling, it's different depths from the bottom on each connection. Now, of course, we'll have a lot of connections that are the same, but you will have different layers. A lot of people have back drill connectors at the higher speeds. There's a lot of different connectors here. And some of them are huge. Uh, you can go out and look at the Samtech uh, booth out there. There are a lot of those out there. Okay, this is called an Examax. And then this is the side. Look, here's your signal wheels that go all the way to the bottom. Well, obviously, there's no stub there. Here are signals that, look, they don't go all the way to the bottom, but they go to layer eight. Well, that means the stub's really small. You don't have to back drill. Remember, it's the length of the stub. So if you only have a few signals, you can put a few signals either on layer one, because there's no Vs at all, bottom layer or up one or two layers because the stub is so small that you don't really care here. Notice it's being broken out here and this is the bottom. And then you have, well, then you got enough, enough, and then full. You can do that with simulation and find out how far up you need to go. And you know this is an after the board is finished process. Everything's finished and then you go back drill it. Uh, many of the board manufacturers now have their own back drill capabilities. You give them a back drill file now. Okay? So this is very popular. Why? Because it's cheaper. For smaller thickness boards like 92s and below, don't worry about it. Under 10 gig, don't worry about it. It's when you start getting over 100 on the thickness of your board and you get above 10, then you have to worry about it. And it does cost a few bucks more, come on. But it's a lot cheaper than like blind and buried, which I happen to love blind vias. But people just won't touch them. And then you have to think about what material do you need? Now, if you're going slow, then of course you want to choose the cheapest stuff you can get. So, you know, there's some nice cheap stuff. And what it is, it's based on all 370 HR. Nice, cheap board material, right? But the loss DF, that's your tangent losses or your loss of your board, dielectric factor, this is a big number. And then the smaller, smaller, smaller it gets. Notice it goes way down to 0.002. This was 0.02. That means it gets less lossy. On losses, if you send a signal out, you send an eye out, it goes down. And as it goes down, one inch, two inches, three inches, it just completely closes. And then your signal disappears. And that is dependent on your board loss. So if you want to use a lot of the cheaper material, here's your 408 FR, then it costs a little bit more, but then again, the losses are better until you start going to Megtron and Megtron 6 and Tachyon, and you notice, ah, oh, the losses are great, which means you can increase your length incredibly, but look at what it costs now compared to an FR. So it's expensive. I mean, some of these are very expensive. We built a 22 layer board. It was a backplane that would fit into a 19 inch rack of tachyon and it was $3,800. That's a lot of money, but it had to be back, plant, yeah, bad, back trilled, everything. Or you can look at what it cost for Intel to make a nice big backplane for their PCs. Those are cheap.
you can do those in the $30 range. But they've got six layers. 22 layers versus six. <laughs> so how much money are you willing to pay? We've got some customers that say, just use this, don't worry about it. And then we have cu some customers that say, if you drag them out of this area, they go crazy. So, which board do you use? Material losses. As your signal goes down the line, it disappears. And there's two kinds of losses. One of them you already know, it's very easy, that's skin effect loss. This one is caused by the physical material in between your boards. And that material is lossy. If you go fast enough, it will conduct and lose signal. And they have all of these charts and all the boards Using a simulator is kind of nice because I can separate them. Of course, you can't on the board. Here's your skin effect loss. Notice this is log versus linear. Normally, you've seen some of these charts. It's a log log and they go like this. They all curve off. I like it if you make this linear. Uh, the curves are linear too because the losses. So here's your dialect. Here's your skin effect loss. Notice the difference in skin effect compared to Board losses, how do they help with skin effect? Make your traces bigger. Gives you more area around, so the skin effect losses go down. Then you've got your dielectric for microstrip and dielectric for strip line. Why are they different? Same material, why should this make any difference? Same traces, same material. Well, on the outside layers, what do you have? A plane and a trace. On the inside layers, you have two planes and a trace. So on your outside layer, what do you have? The trace. Underneath is the board material. What's above? Air. Really low loss, like one. When you have the two of them, you have what? You have board material in the top and the bottom, so it's lossy on both sides. So obviously, the losses are much larger. And then on the end ones, I combined everything. So you need to think about, look, if you want this much board loss and you're using, these would be your Nyquist frequencies for your differential pair, it tells you what board material you're going to need. If you're going slow, you don't care as much. It's when you start going faster and faster. because this is a chart that Scott made for us. We call them reaches. In other words, what length do you need to go if you're designing some backplanes or cards that are very fast? Notice, if you're only going slower, you can use different materials. Here's your FR408. You can use different, but if you're starting to go faster and faster, notice, here's your frequency at the bottom, and you want to go 30 inches, you can't use any of these you have to start using better material. And remember this chart, here's your MEG, here's your tachyon, Teflon, and then here is your coax cables, because they're very low loss. So your slower signals, you can use all this material. As we go faster and faster, your choices go away. So then you have to use different material. Why does everyone complain about the material? Money, it's just pure cost. We don't want to pay for it. And then we have to simulate, simulate, and get our losses. We've got to do what? There's different losses. Here's your insertion loss. Here's your return loss. And here's your crosstalk. So you have to simulate all of your traces as we should be doing it under 10. It's just a lot more difficult. Questions on what I'm showing? These were simulations on our back plane of eight differential pairs next to each other. So what tool is that? Is that an expedition you export S parameter model? Those are S parameter models, that's it. Is that kind of what you go by a lot of times? Just generate an S parameter model and say, 
Yes. Yes. Many of the specifications, like the KRs on the 10Gs and stuff, give you those specs. Mm -hmm. They say, okay, here's what you need for loss, here's how much return loss, and here's how much crosstalk. So if I make all those, then I'm cool. Vias. If you use standard vias a lot of times on higher speed signals, they're not designed well. Because here's a via that I'm running 10 gig through. Here's a via that I modified. Uh, you guys know what pad stacks are, right? Come on. Here's your pad, anti-pad, or clearance. Pad, pad, anti-pad. It's a 12-layer board. Signal, plane, signal, signal, plane, signal, signal, plane. What you need to do is design your pad stack properly. How do you do that? Well, unfortunately, you're going to need a 3D simulator again. What you do is all of your pads, and almost always there's two pads that are connected and the others are empty, yes? You remove all unused pads. Now for all of you engineers, I hope you do that anyway. You should be doing that automatically. Now you don't have to go look at every signal. On the Mentor tool set, on your post-processing, it has a little button that says remove unused pads. Do it. Also the manufacturers like you to do that. They used to keep the pads on to keep the planes from moving around a bit, I mean the signal layers and planes, now they don't like it because it's harder to drill. They like it if you remove them. Some of the companies will even ask you if they can remove them themselves. Remove them on every signal. Now the second one you don't want to do on every signal. What I want to do, and why would we remove the pads? Well, what's a pad look like? It's a capacitor on your via which lowers the impedance of the via. You want to take those off, and then the anti-pad you want to make larger. Two reasons. First of all, around this green anti-pad is a plane. So you've got the barrel to the plane capacitance, make it bigger, it goes down, and you have the, see this pad? Up to this plane, if you make this bigger, that capacitance goes down, which is better for the via also. So you've got to tune your vias. And just like the cutout on the grounds, depends on your stack up. Of course, capacitance, stack up, distances, material. So, but once you made one of these high speed vias, you can use it all over your board. This is just a stored via. And any board that has that same stack up can use the same dimensions. So, remove the pads, change the anti pad side. Can you see the difference? And that's just on a via. Okay, questions on this? Notice I'm not showing you exact things. I want to show you a, a broader brush on, we, we should look at these things. And we didn't have to look at them before. This is either a picture of my shirt or my printed circuit board. And they're about the same. Why? Because they're all weave material. They're all woven material. And for us, this is going to be, if it's an FR4, we've got the fiberglass weave. That we never cared about before. Now it's changed. What happens if I take two traces, run them together, come on, they're differential pair. See, it runs over the weave and this runs over the epoxy. Well, the weave has a different epsilon R, a DK. Well, if it has a different DK, what controls the speed of your traces? The DK, your material. So if I have right here where they're together, look at what the dielectric constant is as compared to if the trace is here and it's not got the doubling on the weave, they're going to have different speeds. And different speeds cause skew. In other words, as you run around, this one's a 3.6, so it's going to be faster and it's going to go whoot, 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 and keep going faster and faster, which gives differential pair skew, which collapses your eye. We didn't care about that before because it really didn't make a difference. And that can be two to four picoseconds per inch, depending on your board material. And you can see the side. There's your trace. 
Notice, where's the trace? Is it over completely under here or is it over here? You don't know and the manufacturers don't know either. So you have to start planning about that. Because we think our board's a solid board material with a trace on top of it. No, we don't know what's underneath it. And what happens is, as you get more and more delay, that's your skew, it looks like insertion loss. So here's 35 picoseconds. That's about right here. It takes, notice it looks like it's closing the eye. So above 10 gig, 25 picoseconds, you know those things. If you're only going two, it's not so important. But as the speeds go up, we need to worry about this. So this is kind of something that new that came out of us going faster. You guys, at your speed, I couldn't, I wouldn't think you would care much about skew. Other than if you route it badly. But you already know that because you said you route your differential pair closely. Match the lengths well. Well, you can, by the way, these are all perfectly matched lengths. That's not the issue. The issue is what's under that length and then that causes your skew. You did everything fine on the board. So how do we fix it? Well, the easy answer is don't go fast. <laughs> hey, that made my job easier. How, depending on the company, some people route their differential pair zigzag in an angle. If you look at some motherboards, you'll see PCI Express going, chin, chin, chin. You're going, was that layout guy doing drugs that day or what? And it does help. And of course, you can buy finer weave parts. The weaves are closer. They have full closure now on the weaves. And of course, you don't think that'll be free, do you? Somebody's going to make some money here someplace. Uh, did you ever get the uh, material where the weaves at an angle or something like that so you don't end up running over the weave? Ask manufacturers that. They'll do it for you. It'll cost more because all their machinery is set so that the weave is at square angles as it comes off the roll. And I've seen some people take their board and spin it on the panel and then do it that way, but then you have to cut the corners off. Somebody's going to pay for that, too. So there's lots of answers. Notice they all seem to have something to do with dollar bills. And that's kind of the problem. We worry about that a lot on, on the boards we're working on that. Then the next thing is copper roughness. When you think of the copper on your board, you always think it's really nice and smooth. These are obviously magnifications. This is a copper trace. Doesn't look so smooth to me. And they measure them now with RZ there's 10, 6, and 3. Notice this at higher frequencies when the frequency wavelength can fit in some of these bumps. With the real long, it doesn't matter. As you go faster and faster, the wavelength can fit some of these and it causes losses. At slower speeds, don't worry about it. But as we go faster, those losses can be significant. Look, here's 5 gig, that is your Nyquist for 10 gigabits per second. Notice the difference in losses. There's 16 to what? 19? What, 3 dB? How much is 3 dB? Don't say, don't say half. I said it already too late. Now remember, S parameters on voltages, which have a square in them. For 3 dB, that's a power thing. We're working with voltages, so you take the square outside the log, remember, and you make it a 20 instead. So it's 60 dB for half. But hey, that's a lot just because of your trace. Now, of course, here's a regular trace, differential pair, you can tell. This is called VLP, very low profile. Some company call it, some of them have their own name. Notice how smooth the trace is. I remember the name VLP because that means very large price. You don't think any of this is free, do you? Because they don't want this. Matter of fact, 
Some manufacturers make the roughness higher. They do it with some etches. Why? Because then it adheres, it sticks to the board better. Because those little fingers and everything that we don't want, that sticks to the fiberglass better. So they want this, they don't want that. So it is harder to process. At your speeds, you won't care. On the big back plane I talked about, we use this. Questions on what this is? Never worried about it before. And this you could use even for lower speeds. The way you route your, your transmits and receives. Okay, you got to transmit, receive, PN, transmit, PN. Here's the way you should route them when you route them out of a chip. Unfortunately, most of them are pinned out this way, right? Transmit, receive, transmit, receive, transmit, receive. This is actually much better, but harder to route. Why is it better? If you have crosstalk here from this channel to this one, if you're in the middle of the board, there's only reverse crosstalk. So the reverse crosstalk does what? It goes back to the driver. Most of them have an output impedance of 50, which means it stops. Okay. And the driver doesn't care. It's a driver. Now, if you route a transmit next to a receive, you get reverse crosstalk. Where does it go? It goes back to where? Oh, the receiver, and is terminated. That means it gets full crosstalk immediately at the receiver. That's your noise. Can you do this? Of course. What happens is that means the spacing has to be larger if you do transmit receive, as you can see by the green arrow. That makes sense? And if it's not terminated, the crosstalk reflects and goes in this direction, and since the board is lossy, it makes the crosstalk go down, 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 way before it hits the receiver. Well, the crosstalk here, the near-end crosstalk, this crosstalk that goes reverse, immediately goes here and stops, which means you get full crosstalk. You can use either one, just think about your crosstalk. I always did that because that's the pin out of the part. Questions? When you put your bypass capacitors, your decoupling capacitors, how do you mount them? And you're going, what's that got to do with signal integrity? Well, now that we're using, remember he said 65 amps at a volt, that means you got some current flowing around. And where do you get the current? Well, of course, you get the current first from your planes, but your planes don't have a lot of ability to hold current. So where do you get your next current from? Those capacitors all over your board. Well, if you make the mounting inductance, if you make this number the how you mount it on the board high, that means that it limits the current that can flow to the plane. Obviously, we want zero. So uh, this is determined by how you mount your capacitors. Now, don't forget you also want low, low effective series inductance, ESL of your capacitance, but I've seen people get really nice capacitors, and what do they do? They mount it really badly. So for you point, and I know you guys aren't layout guys, but you should still know what this looks like. How do you mount your capacitors on your boards? And what physical size do you use? What inductance is the capacitance? Those things are important. Not so important when you're going slow because your power requirements aren't so big. But now our DIDTs are huge, so we need to keep those planes at a low impedance, and the capacitors are part of that low impedance formula. So which one do you use? Obviously, the best are via in via in pad. You know how many people use via in pad? Not many. It always comes up that thing, the fingers and the thumb. It's always a money issue. That is the best because of the loop inductance is smaller. But we don't use that. They cannot do this, by the way, because it has to be in the center. But I just showed that is the best of the best. And these are only the mounting. I didn't include vias or any of that. You have to put that in there, too. Because your vias can be quite large, too. This is for an 0402 capacitor. 
I hope you're not using larger bypass decoupling capacitors. Are any of you using bigger packages? 0805, 1206, the small aircraft carrier. Excuse me? Nice. Cost more, they're nice though, aren't they? Quite nice. But you still got to be able to mount them correctly. Maybe you use more than two vias on those. Four is typical. So those kind of things help. Now these are the cheap ones because they have much better capacitors. X to Y those, but they cost more money. But don't use big capacitors. Big capacitors have a bigger ESL and mount them correctly. Okay, which one of them do you guys use? <laughs> hmm? Now what the PCB uh, manager tells us, if you've got VNL on one IC, you can have them for a long time. Oh, absolutely. I, I want you to do this. Well, we always have that because we've always got the, uh, the QFN packages with, you know, the thermal views. So, so we always have that. Wow. <laughs> you guys got it covered. You got yeah. the, the best. Boy, it's, yeah, maybe we don't miss something here. Well, yeah. He it, said, if you, you do it for one, I see you can do it for the whole so, thing. So, 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 you got a QFN thermal pad, you got VIN in that pad? Yeah, because it's uh, usually a round VIN or a thermal VIN, so you got it for one, so you got it for the whole thing. So, they consider that the same as a VIN pad on the cat? Yeah, that's interesting. You, but you have to use the same size VIN. Okay. If you have different size VIN pads, there is a cost difference. Big so time. It'd be the same one. Okay. What size do you use? Fives? Do you have boxy fill? Excuse me? Do you both process a boxy fill or no? No. Okay. Um, we, on some we do and some we fill metal fill because of the thermal that we need. Sure. That's mass. More and more. Well, but if you do it, again, they do it for a whole board. If you do one, you do one, you can do a hundred. I mean, yeah, once you got the process, yeah, you're there. The yeah. Most people will not let, will not use this. The last I talked, less than 5% of the world uses VM pad. That's not a big number, but you're the 5%. You're special. <laughs> Which, yeah. 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 You guys have that special thing cost. We don't care about no stinking cost. <laughs> so this is bad. Obviously, the best. What do you guys use? As far as these go? Yes. Yeah. Comfortably pumped, about 287 top left. Yep. The most of the industry uses these two and this one. Now, one thing, if you're going to use this, put your vias close together, which these are not. You can see they're on the spacing of your 0402. If you put them close together, what happens to the vias? If you put two vias, two conductors close together, what happens to the inductance of those conductors? Well, it goes down and your mutual goes up. That's what you want. So putting them next to each other is a good thing. So I put these minimum. Matter of fact, you can tell. Notice how close they are. The anti-pad from this via touches the pad from this one. The anti-pad from this via touches there. So I overlap anti-pads. Most companies will let you do that. Some will not. And that's where this one comes from. It's not a big, big difference. But if you can get them close, that's a good thing to do. Question. Well, it seems like you guys do the right thing. I still have customers that use 1206s. You can build condos out of those. And they put, some of them still do this. So it sounds like you understand how this works already. What's the extra cost associated with varying the VIN pad? You guys probably know better than I do. I know that if you... The guy next door knows that. I know the extra cost for doing blind vary, blinds are less than 10% now. I visited a house and they put an entire panel in and the panel was completely burned and done in two minutes. Well, you know, they rasterize it laser, you just put it down, clamshell, and it goes, all it did is make a funny noise, and it was done. So that's not so much. Now, the buried via is 
that's an extra press that cost more. I remember saying that, uh, that you know, the cost keeps going down. It was a lot more 10 years ago, but now it's uh, not much of a premium. Uh, what are you doing? Oh, yeah. 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 The standard vias are too big for one thing. Well, you, that, you have to count them during the path. Or you don't have a close of pace. So, uh, so, what, so if you don't cap them and you lose some pace through it, so what? You end up getting bubbles yeah. and it destroys the solder joint and you're actually getting gas in the solder joint. It'll lift it up and make bubbles and then you're screwed. Okay, so, so it's plugging the V, I guess. Yeah, that's where the epoxy filter goes. The process is an option, but it, it costs about a dollar board. And, and they just take them and splay them over the top. But like I said, we use them for thermal, so we actually, we play them on the shut. So they're filled with copper and plugged Yeah, you gotta talk to your manufacturer. Some people don't even do it. I mean, they don't have the capability of doing it. So a dollar a board, how big is your board? <laughs> Extra? Yeah, most of our boards are small. Small, okay. Because I was asking that, because that's an awfully small price. So, yeah. The bigger boards, they're a lot more expensive. We don't even really notice the cost difference. Yeah, because our engineering costs so much. When you think about it, you know, it's, it's some of the you know, yeah. military, you know, a lot of this does not matter. Sure. Okay. Any questions on, on what I'm trying to show? That's all I have on this, except this last slide. How do you know it's gonna work? You guys gotta start simulating everything, everything, everything. You know, you can get away with rules of thumb when your speeds are significantly slower, but when you start breaking that 10 and start going from you know, 16 or 20 or 24, it's tough. The designs are more difficult. So we tell our customers, look, you need to have an SIPI engineer as part of your team or as an auxiliary. You know, a lot of companies like Intel, their SI people are with the layout people because they work together a lot. Or you need to go outside and get somebody in consulting. And even at your slower speeds, let's pick TDR. Come on, you think about it and the speeds aren't that hard. They're not that high, but it's a difficult job. So I'm just hoping all of you do simulations. That's the big thing. Okay? We do them, of course, that's our job. Buy some tools, do something. And the rules of thumb, they don't work so much anymore. There's too many variables now. If you want to get a hold of us, it's inquire at terraspeed.com. Or you can just write rod at Terraspeed. Best is inquire at Terraspeed.com and we can talk about things.